Income tax 2023-2024. What method can you use to depreciate property? Get ready and some coffee because we're setting our refund to the max with income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in Publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers Listed Property, and more, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, remembering the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements have an income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The sole proprietorship schedule C rolling into line one income of the formula. The schedule C itself also in essence being an income statement having business income minus business expenses which could be called business deductions resulting in in essence net business income. That net income rolling in from schedule C to line one income of the formula. The formula representing the calculation on form 1040, this being the first page of the 1040, Schedule C ultimately rolling into line 8, additional income from Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income part 1, additional income, Schedule C rolling into line 3, business income or loss. Here is a profit and loss Schedule C form has an income statement or P&L profit and loss format income minus expenses the expenses typically being the largest category with the most things in it some expenses being more complex than others such as depreciation where as we discussed in prior presentation and will continue to discuss here even if we're on a cash based system we might have to put depreciable properties such as property plant and equipment on the books as an asset with which with regards to a schedule c isn't a balance sheet typically but rather another schedule a depreciation schedule and then allocate the cost of that property to the years that we consume it and that's going to be the concept of depreciation all right so what methods do we use now as we get into these methods you always want to compare the depreciation methods to the default method of depreciation the straight line method that's the most intuitive method in other words if i had a ten thousand piece of property ten thousand dollar piece of property it i think it's going to last 10 years well maybe it would make most sense for me just to divide the property by 10 and then allocate a thousand dollars a year for 10 years as i consume the property now then there's going to be variations from that some of those variations making sense and being pulled from by the tax code, generally accepted accounting principles, some of those changes not making sense from an accounting standpoint, but whatever from a legal standpoint or a political standpoint or a lobbyist standpoint or whatever, it makes sense from that standpoint. And that's what we'll look in here with regards to the taxes, because remember for taxes, the incentives are different. If I was doing my own books for generally accepted accounting principles, if I was a publicly traded company, the goal then is to make the financial statements, for example, as accurate as possible and in compliance with regulations to help us to do that so that they are comparable and so on. 
whereas the goal as a tax uh, as a taxpayer will typically be to pay as little taxes as I can uh, within the law. Therefore, I have an incentive to try to depreciate more upfront typically with taxes and the IRS is going to have to take generally accepted accounting principles and alter them a bit, right, so that they restrict us a bit more to so that uh, we take the method that's used under the tax laws, the general idea. All right. So you must use the modified accelerated cost recovery system. That's the just normal maker's uh, method. So that's kind of the default for most properties, like equipment, for example, will typically default to using a maker's method, which you can kind of think of as like a double declining balance with a half year convention. We'll talk about shortly to depreciate most property. Makers is discussed in chapter four, so we'll talk about that more later. You cannot use makers to depreciate the following property. So you cannot use makers for property you placed in service before 1987. We're gonna be consistent once the property is placed in service under the old rules, you would think that we would just keep depreciating under whatever rules we started with as long as it was a proper depreciation method. Certain property owned or used in 1987, intangible property, so that those things like patents and things that you can't actually physically touch have different depreciation rules, possibly straight line, for example, films, videotapes, and recordings, uh, certain corporate and partnership property acquired in a non-taxable transfer and property you elected to exclude from makers. So these top ones, of course, are ones that wouldn't generally be under makers typically, although they're not the most normal types of property. And then possibly you can elect and say, I don't want to choose makers. Now, usually you would because it's going to give you that accelerated method, but there could be situations where it would be beneficial from a tax standpoint to try to say, no, I'd rather choose the other another method if possible for depreciation this piece of property. So property you placed in service before 1987, you cannot use makers for property you placed in service before 1987, except property you placed in service after July 31st, 1986, if makers was elected. So we be consistent. We are consistent once we make the election typically for depreciation consistency being a standard accounting principle. Property placed in service before 1987 must be depreciated under the methods discussed in publication 534. So use so obviously if you have property on the books from a logistical standpoint prior to 1987, if you're using the same software, it should roll over properly into the next year. And so it, it shouldn't be something you have to figure out too much because it's already on the books properly categorized from a depreciation standpoint and the software will hopefully help you to move it uh, forward. But of course, if you have questions about that property, which still could be impacting current years because of this long-term depreciation thing, then you can look at publication 534. Use of real property changed. So you must generally use makers to depreciate real property. So we're talking like real estate, for example, that you acquired for personal use before 1987 and changed to business or income producing use after 1986. So that gets a little bit confusing because now we have this situation where we have the change of the property from personal to business. And as we saw, that can cause some confusion because of what's the cost that I should be transferring from personal to business since I didn't just purchase it on a market transaction and what then are the related depreciation rules for that property. Improvements made after 1987. You must treat improvements made after 19, I'm sorry, 1986. After 1986 to property you placed in service before 1987 as separate depreciable property. So in other words, this typically is the case with real estate property, for example. We have it on the books, we can imagine before 1986 and therefore are using the prior rules for the depreciation of the property possibly, but now we're doing improvements on it. When you make improvements, the question is, is it an improvement or is it maintenance? If it was maintenance, we might be able to deduct it in the current time frame. If it's improvements, then we're gonna have to depreciate it. Then the question is, well, if I depreciate it, do I have to use the prior depreciation rules because that's what the depreciation rule for the building is? And generally the answer would be no, it's gonna go on the books as a separate 
thing, not as part of the original cost of the building, although when you sell the building, it'll be, it'll be part of the basis, typically calculating the gain or the loss, but it's going to be put on the books as a separate improvement that you would then depreciate. Therefore, uh, you can depreciate the improvement as separate property under makers if it is the type of property that otherwise qualifies for makers depreciation instead of the old depreciation, which would match you know, the building that's on the books because it was on the books before that time. Okay, so for more information about improvements, see how do you treat repairs and improvements later and additions and improvements under which recovery period applies. All right, property owned or used in 1986. You may not be able to use makers for property you acquired and placed in service after 1986 if any of the situations described below apply. Uh, you can, uh, if you cannot use makers, the property must be depreciated under the methods discussed in publication 534. So you or someone related to you owned or used the property in 1986. So we have this related person thing. Clearly that often causes a problem because you don't have the, mar the market arm's length transaction when you're talking about related persons. So you acquired the property from a person who owned it in 1986 and as part of the transaction, the user of the property did not change. You leased the property to a person or someone related to this person who owned or used the property in 1986. You acquired the property in a transaction in which the user of the property did not change and the property was not maker's property in the hands of the person from whom you acquired it because of two or three above. Okay, real property. You generally cannot use makers for real property. So we're talking like real estate section 1250 property. So specifically section 1250 property if any of the following uh, situations in any of the following situations. You or someone related to you own the property in 1986. Once again, you lease the property to a person who owned the property in 1986 or someone related to that person. So you acquired the property in a like kind exchange. So we talked a little bit about those uh, before. And in that situation, oftentimes you have this kind of trade off of maintaining the basis of the prior property. So you would think that would also have an implications on the depreciation and possibly the methods of depreciation. Again, the, the like kind exchanges get into it, their own specifics because they can become quite complicated and could actually be a, a field or area of specialization in and of themselves. So you acquired the property in a like kind exchange uh, in voluntary conversion so you were required to convert it possibly by the government for whatever reason or a repossession of property or uh, someone related to you owned it in 1986. So makers applies only to that part of your basis in the acquired property that represents cash paid or unlike property given up. It does not apply to the carried over part of the basis because again, in those situations, you might have the basis carrying over which again will have an impact on the depreciation is possibly comp past the, the the scope that we're going to dive into here so exceptions the rules above do not apply to the following residential rental property or non-residential real property so any property if in the first tax year it is placed in service the deduction under the accelerated cost recovery system which is acres rather than makers is more than the deduction under makers uh, using the half year convention for information on how to figure depreciation under acres you can see publication 534 obviously software helps greatly for us to be calculating these uh, different depreciation systems, uh, which can become quite complex, especially as your depreciation schedules get longer over time and rules change uh, over time. Therefore, you have different property on the books using possibly different uh, depreciation schedules, which again, if you did everything correct when you bought the property and placed it on the books and are using good software that's consistent from year to year is actually not too difficult but when thing when you change software or 
or when there's a problem in the depreciation schedules or it's not clear how things were put on the depreciation schedules, you can't identify the property clearly, for example, then things can get quite messy. So property what, that was maker's property in the hands of the person from whom you acquired it because of two above. All right, related purpose persons. For this purpose, the following are related persons. Related persons be, can become important for taxes because it's not an arm's length transaction. Therefore, you end up with these funny transactions, which the IRS will be skeptical of possibly people doing things to try to uh, eliminate taxes. So in other words, you can imagine if like a parent is, is doing a transaction with their child, they have an incentive to just give their child things, right? So you would think that the market price would not necessarily be reflective if it wasn't a related person, which can have impacts on uh, taxes and could be subject to tax manipulation if the IRS wasn't, didn't put rules in with regards to related persons. All right, number one, an individual and a member of their family, including only a spouse, child, parent, sibling, half sibling, uh, ancestor, and lineal descendant. Number two, a corporation and an individual who directly or indirectly owns more than 10% of the value of the outstanding stock of that corporation. Number three, two corporations that are members of the same controlled group. Number four, a trust fiduciary and a corporation if more than 10% of the value of the outstanding stock is directly or indirectly owned by or for the trust or grantor of the trust. Number five, the grantor and fiduciary and the fiduciary and beneficiary of any trust. Number six, the fiduciaries of two different trusts and the fiduciaries and beneficiaries of two different trusts if the same person is the grantor of both trusts. Now, obviously, some of that gets a little bit technical in terms of different types of legal entities and trusts and whatnot. That's beyond the scope here, so we'll just mention them and keep moving forward. So it's seven, a tax exempt additional uh, educational or charitable organization and any person or if that person is an individual, a member of that person's family who directly or indirectly controls the organization. Number eight, two S corporations and an S corporation and a regular corporation if the same persons own more than 10% of the value of the outstanding stock of each corporation. Number nine, a corporation and a partnership if the same person own both of the following. A, more than 10% of the value of the outstanding stock of the corporation. B, more than 10% of the capital or profit interest in the partnership. 10, uh, the executor and beneficiary of any estate. 11, a partnership and a person who directly or indirectly own more than 10% of the capital or profit interest in the partnership. 12, uh, two partnerships if the same person directly or indirectly own more than 10% of the capital or profit interest in each. 13, the related persons and a uh, person uh, and a person who is engaged in trades or businesses under common control. Okay. So when to determine a uh, relationship. So you must determine whether you are related to another person at the time you acquire the property. So a partnership acquiring property from a terminating partnership must determine whether it is related to the terminating partnership immediately before the event uh, causing the termination. Constructive ownership of stock or partnership interest. To determine whether a person directly or indirectly owns any of the outstanding stock of a corporation or an interest in a partnership, apply the following rules. Stock or a partnership interest directly or indirectly owned by or for a corporation, partnership, estate, or trust is considered owned proportionately by or for its shareholders, partners, or beneficiaries. However, for a partnership interest owned by or for a C corporation, this applies only to shareholders who directly or indirectly own 5% or more of the value of the stock of the corporation. An individual is considered to own the stock or partnership interest directly or indirectly owned 
by or for the individual's family, an individual who owns except by applying rule two, any stock in a corporation is considered to own the stock directly or indirectly owned by or for the individual's partner. Uh, for purposes of rule one, two, or three, stock or a partnership interest considered to be owned by a person under rule one is treated as actually owned by that person. However, stock or a partnership interest considered to be owned by an individual under rule two or three is not treated as owned by the individual for reapplying either rule two or three to make another person considered to be the owner of the same stock or partnership interest. In other words, this can get quite complex if you have many different structured entities that are set up to determine the level of ownership to be applying these very kind of specific type of rules with regards to the level of ownership to be a related party. All right, intangible property. So generally, if you can depreciate intangible property, you usually use the straight line method of depreciation. So we've, we've been saying that most of the time we use makers for many types of things like machinery, uh, property plant and equipment generally. But if it's intangible, these are usually things that are property due to legal rights, such as a, a patent or something like that. If you can depreciate it, usually you're going to use the good old straight line method nice and easy however you can choose to depreciate certain intangible property under the income uh, forecast method discussed later caution so you cannot depreciate intangible property that is a section 179 intangible or that does not otherwise meet all the requirements discussed earlier under what property can be depreciated all right straight line method this is basically the default method so it's not usually the method that you're going to be used all the time, except for some of these intangibles, possibly. But it's also the starting method that you want to kind of think about when you then get to these more complex methods, such as the maker's method, which basically uses an accelerated method, like a double declining, which makes sense from an accounting standpoint as well. Because from an accounting standpoint, you might say, hey, look, it makes sense for me to depreciate my forklift more in year one than year five because the value goes down faster in year one uh, and then the tax code deviates from that kind of accounting method strategy that makes sense with things like 179 deduction and so on okay so this method lets you deduct the same amount of depreciation each year over the useful life of the property so if it was a ten thousand dollar piece of property it was had a 10 year useful life you just take 10,000 divided by 10 and depreciate 1,000 for 10 years. To figure your depreciation, first det determine the adjusted basis, salvage valued and estimated useful life of the property. Subtract the salvage value. That's the value that we think the property might be worth at the end of the useful life. So if I had my 10,000 piece of property, but I think after 10 years, after it's used up, I'm going to still have salvage value of 2000 then the value once it's used up will still be 2000 and therefore I should depreciate the 10000 minus the 2000 in general. So subtract the salvage value if any from the from the adjusted basis the balance is the total depreciation you can take over the useful life of the property. Divide the balance by the number of years in the useful life. This gives you your, your yearly depreciation deduction. Unless there is a big change in adjusted basis or useful life, this amount will stay the same throughout the time you depreciate the property. If in the, in the first year you use the property for less than a full year, you must uh, prorate your depreciation deduction for the number of months in use. So one of the complications that comes up with straight line as well as other depreciation methods is, well, how much should I depreciate in the current year? With straight line, we're, we're typically looking uh, prorate for the number of months in use. So you might be tying it to the number of months. For makers, oftentimes we're going to use a mid-year convention, basically assuming we bought it in the middle of the year or possibly a mid-quarter or mid-month convention, which we'll talk more about later. Example, 
In April, you bought a patent for $5,100 that is not a Section 179 intangible. You depreciate the patent under the straight line method using a 17-year useful life and no salvage value because, of course, the patent is, not, is going to be worthless after the patent runs out, so there's no, you're not going to scrap it for metal because it's intangible. You divide the, one, the 5,100 basis by 17 years to get your 300 yearly depreciation deduction. So uh, you only use the patent for nine months during the first year. So you multiply uh, 300 by nine twelfths because nine months out of 12 is how much you used it in the first year of operations to get your deduction of 225 for the first year. Next year, you can deduct 300 for the full year because you'll have the full year. Patents and copyrights. So if you can depreciate the cost of a patent or copyright, right, use the straight line method over the useful life because that's basically, these are the intangibles that we use the straight line as opposed to the makers, which is more of a double declining method. The useful life of a patent or copyright is the lesser of the life granted it by the government or the remaining life when you acquire it. In other words, if you have a patent or copyright that you put up, you set up the patent or copyright, then there's it's a legal thing in terms of how long you're going to get a benefit of the patent or copyright because it's created by law. But it's possible to buy a patent or copyright in which case some time has already passed. So when you buy it, then you're going to depreciate the patent or copyright over the remaining useful life of the patent or copyright. Right. However, if the patent or copyright becomes valueless before the end of its useful life, you can deduct it uh, in that year and its remaining cost or other basis. In other words, if it becomes of, of no value and you still have it on the books, but now it has no value, then you might be able to, in essence, kind of to take the loss or depreciate it, the rest of it uh, at that point in time. So computer software. Computer software is generally a section 17, or I'm sorry, 197. I got that backwards a few times, I'm sorry. It's a section 197 intangible and cannot be depreciated if you acquire it in connection with the acquisition of assets consisting of business uh, or a substantial part of a business. However, computer software is not a section 197 intangible and can be depreciated even if acquired in connection with the acquisition of a business if it meets all of the following tests. Uh, it is ready available for purchase by the general public. It is subject to a non-exclusive license. Uh, it has not been substantially modified. If the software meets the tests above, it may also qualify for the Section 179 uh, deduction and the special depreciation allowance discussed later in Chapter 2 and 3. If you can depreciate the cost of computer software, use the straight line method over the useful life of 36 months. All right, tax exempt use property subject to a lease. So the useful life of computer software leased under a lease agreement entered into after March 12, 2024 to a tax-exempt organization, governmental unit, or foreign person or entity other than partnership, uh, other than a partnership cannot be less than 125% of the lease term. So we're going into somewhat of the more unusual situations here, and then we're going to dive more into like the maker's situation, which is the standard depreciation for much of the property, this property planting equipment. Certain created intangibles. You can amortize certain intangibles created on or after December 31st, 2003 over a 15 year period using the straight line method and no salvage value, even though they have a useful life that cannot be estimated with reasonable uh, accuracy. For example, amounts paid to acquire memberships or privileges of uh, ident uh, indefinite duration, such as a trade association membership, are eligible costs. So we saw with the patents, we know exactly how long to depreciate it because it's a matter of law. But sometimes we don't know, so we might use the method that they allow us to have, 15-year period. So the following... so. Uh, so we have this such as trade associations. So the following are not eligible. 
So any intangible asset acquired from uh, another person, uh, created financial interests, any intangible asset that has a useful life that can be estimated with reasonable accuracy. In other words, you wouldn't use the 15 years, you'd probably use that useful life. Any intangible asset that has an amortization period or limited useful life that is uh, specifically prescribed or prohibited by the code, regulations, or other published IRS guideline, any amount paid to facilitate an acquisition of a trade or business, a change in the capital structure or a business entity, and certain other transactions. All right, you must also uh, increase the 15-year safe harbor amortization period to 25-year period for certain uh, intangibles related to benefits arising from the provision, production, or improvement of real property. So real estate situations typically have longer uh, useful lives uh, oftentimes. So for this purpose, real property includes property that will remain attached to the real property for an indefinite period of time, such as roads, bridges, tunnels, pavements, and uh, pollution control facilities. Income forecast method. You can choose to use the income forecast method instead of the straight line method to depreciate the following depreciable intangibles. So we have motion picture films and videotapes, sound records, copyrights, books, and patents. Under the income forecast method, each year's depreciation deduction is equal to the cost of the property multiplied by a fraction. The numerator of the fraction is the current year's net income from the property, and the denominator is the total income anticipated from the property through the end of the 10th tax year. Following the tax year, the property is placed in service. So that's a somewhat of an unusual, pretty unusual situation. But if you're in that situation, more information, you can see section 167G of the IRS Internal Revenue Code films, videotapes, and recordings. You cannot use makers for motion picture films, videotapes, and sound recordings. For this purpose, sound recordings are discs, tapes, or other phonograph uh, phone, phono recordings resulting from the fixation of a series of sounds. So you can depreciate these properties using either the straight line method or the income forecast method. Uh, participations and residuals. You can include participations and residuals and the adjusted basis of the property for purposes of computing your depreciation deduction under the income forecast method. The participation and residuals must relate to income to be derived from the property before the end of the 10th tax year after the property is placed in service. For this purpose, par uh, participations and residuals are defined as costs, which by contract vary with the amount of income earned in connection with the property. So instead of including these amounts in the adjusted basis of the property, you can deduct the cost in the tax year that they are paid. So election to exclude property from makers. So now you have a situation where makers will typically apply, and that's usually what you would want to use because it's an accelerated method, but possibly you elect not to, to use the makers. So if you can properly depreciate any property under a method not based on a term of years, such as the unit of production method, you can elect to exclude that property from makers. So in other words, the makers is kind of like an accelerated depreciation method. So it's like a straight line, but we depreciate more upfront. The straight line method and makers, as you can see, therefore, are kind of dependent on time intervals, meaning we have property, we judge how long it's gonna last in years and depreciate it over that number of years or months, right? But you could say maybe that's not the best way to do it for like a car, for example, I might depreciate it over the lifetime of miles that I think the car is going to drive. Or if I have a piece of machinery that makes widgets, I might better want to depreciate it by the number of widgets that I think it's going to make in its lifetime and then depreciate it by, wi by widgets made, which would be a unit of production method, which is probably better in some situations and more accurate possibly. 
So you make the election by reporting your depreciation for a property on line 15 and part two of form 4562 and attaching a statement as described in the instructions for form 4562. Again, in my experience, I haven't seen that happen too much, but in certain industries, that is something that could certainly come up. So you must make this election by the return due date, including extensions for the tax year you place your property in service. However, if you timely filed your return for the year without making the election, you can still make the election by filing an amended return uh, within six months of the due date. So remember, consistency is important with the tax code because we obviously, once we're locked into the depreciation method, have to be consistent with it. What if you messed up? Well, then maybe you can go back and amend it, but the statute of limitations, the time frame in order to allow you to do that could be severely limited. So attach the election uh, to the amended return and write, quote, filed pursuant to section 301.9100 slash two on the election statement, file the amended return at the same address you filed the original return. Use of standard mileage rate. So if you use the standard mileage rate to figure your tax deduction for your business automobile, you are treated as having made an election to exclude the automobile from makers. This is clearly the most common exclusion from makers. In other words, the automobile uh, would be a property plant and equipment, which if we were using the actual method as opposed to the mileage method. If we were using the actual method, we would have to depreciate it typically using makers, which might then be limited with some auto limitations uh, with regards to things like the 179 and how much we can depreciate in year one and so on. But if we elect not to do that because we're gonna use the mileage method, the use of the mileage method is basically an election to not have the standard depreciation because within the mileage method is embedded the the idea or cost of the depreciation kind of included in that one lump sum number so you can see publication 463 for details of the standard mileage rate